there's two things that motivate our humanity. I've heard people say three, but for me, I have distill it down to two, hope and fear. The third one's love. Hope and fear are the two main motivators. And fear is the thing that tends to be the first response. It's the fight or flight. It's what's kept us alive, getting changed by saber tooth tigers. And it's just natural. It's just not optimal. And what I can tell you is that hope is actually the greater, more powerful motivator. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Kingdom Real Estate Investor Podcast. Your host, Ellis Hammond. And, you know, here today's going to be really cool. Uh, we sometimes get the chance to bring on a guest who, and it's not necessarily in the world of real estate, but it is an amazing entrepreneur. I was just telling him before the show, and I'm excited for you guys to meet him. But as you guys are listening, you know, a lot of people get into real estate because they want to pursue financial freedom. And I think which is a great goal. However, that, that often means you didn't start as an entrepreneur. Like I imagine many of you started in a W-2 job or you, maybe you currently have a job. But what I have learned in being in the world of real estate for three years and growing companies is that like you got to you got to pretty quickly become an entrepreneur. Like you have to think like an entrepreneur. And that is a very, very different mental space. It is a very, very different way of doing things than the rest of the world. Yes, you can buy a real estate investment property. You can go buy your duplex or whatever and still keep your job, still think like your job. But if you really want to move into really building significant wealth, creating legacy, impacting change, uh, you have to start thinking like an entrepreneur. And for that reason, I'm really excited to introduce to you guys, Brad uh, Peterson today. And, and he's gonna share all about uh, his failures and successes and what it takes to really grow and some really cool stuff he's doing uh, in, in the world of innovation and sustainability and his book launch, Startup Santa. So Brad, welcome to the show, man. Alice, it's so, so awesome to be here. I've enjoyed listening to your podcast and uh, you know, I understand that the focus is on real estate, but it's really ultimately about creating value. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can create some value in our conversation today. Dude, I say that all the time. I say, you know, the, the key for me, I was a pastor. I don't know how much you know about my story. I was a pastor before this and had no idea how to make money. My dad was entrepreneur, my mom was entrepreneurs, but my dad passed when I was 21. So I never really had a chance to kind of learn from him about business. And then uh, my mom was started her own company, a hairstylist, but I don't know, for whatever reason, I never really looked at my mom as an entrepreneur until recently. So one of the big, the big mental shifts I had to learn early on in getting in, like even breaking free from that, you know, old money mindset, I call it, was that money is tied to value. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I used to think that there was such a shortage of money on the planet, but when I've learned, when I begin to learn that money is just tied to value and then as Christians, as followers of Christ, as ones who are made in the image of God, we are holders of infinite value. We can create infinite mm -hmm. value and therefore money, money became very abundant in that regard. Right. And so even as you saying that man unlocks, I hope something for our listeners as well. 100%. Well said. Yeah, we, we get paid for the value we create in the marketplace. Ultimately, that is how we're compensated. And the more value, uh, the more you're compensated, the you know bigger the problem, the bigger opportunity to create value. Uh, and I firmly believe that you know as Christians, people who know how this all ends, we should be willing to take the biggest bets. We should be willing to be the most bold and to lean into solving very big problems. I hope we can encourage some people to do that today. Yeah. Well, before we started the show, you were talking about your seven ventures. <laughs> you said, <laughs> uh, I lost three. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mildly successful in two or something, right? Survived two. Uh, yeah. Crushed it at one. Um, and, and now really, really building uh, what, what you feel like is going to be your legacy. So, uh, guys, that's what you have to look forward to today. But I want to I want to pray for us before we get in and we'll, and we'll get started. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for Brad. Uh, thank you for aligning our paths in this podcast show. And I pray, I pray, I pray, Holy Spirit, come and that you would bless our listeners and uh, you, you would take uh, these stories, these experiences and transform our minds and our thoughts, God, to be more like you, the the entrepreneur, the risk taker, mm -hmm. the creator, and that you would align our hearts and our minds to you for your name's sake. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's let's start there though, man. I, I do want to go back to the the three, you know, like go back to the three that you lost. I mean, what? How did you become an entrepreneur? Now that we're on this topic of entrepreneurship, like three wasn't enough to be like this is, you know, like how many times you had to get your face knocked in to 
to be like, well, maybe this isn't for me. <laughs> you know, Winston Churchill had this quote. He said, you know, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. I can certainly say that uh, resilience is a key attribute for anybody who wants to do anything great in entrepreneurship. But going into the history, I actually wasn't supposed to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I actually was in school to be a chiropractor. And part of the reason for that is that, you know, my father was a chiropractor my grandfather, grandmother were chiropractors. And my great, great grandfather was actually the very first chiropractor in Denmark. So this was kind of like your predestined to do <laughs> thing, but there was a problem. I, uh, I was just a really curious kid and kind of mischievous in a good way, you know, and I just found at an early age, I was very entrepreneurial. I was constantly doing those entrepreneurial things that kids do, the prototypical like lemonade stand. But my, my versions of that were, you know, I'd sneak into golf courses after hours and find golf balls in the pond. I'd actually find if I could get in there with my skin diving mask, I could go down and there would just be this like cornucopia of balls everywhere and i package them up and then sell you them would ju- time out you jumped into the nasty golf pond with goggles <laughs> to get in oh that is wild dude that, that is serious commitment right there yeah. i've never seen a golf pond no matter how nice the course is that look that look you know good enough to jump into <laughs> well, the cost of goods was right i mean there were free yeah. balls and i could sell a dozen for five bucks and to me that was just a good outcome i could finance my adventures so right. Um, so that, that was kind of some stuff I was doing. And then I would, at 16, um, I tell people I had the perfect business. It was a wood cutting business. I, I'm, I'm from Canada. I lived on an acreage and uh, my father had a pickup truck. He had chainsaws, he had uh, splitters and malls, and we had all this endless forest on our property. And so I decided, Hey, I can go harvest these trees and I can start a wood cutting business. So the reason it was a perfect business is that I was using my dad's truck, his chainsaw, his gas, everything. I just had to put in my sweat equity and then, you know, whatever I sold this wood for was, was my profits. And, uh, you know, I hired some buddies from school to come help me. And again, use those proceeds to help finance adventures at an early age. So all this was happening really early on. And the real transition happened actually when I got involved in a network marketing opportunity at 19, which kind of young, but I was very ambitious. And that opportunity actually didn't work out, but what it did do is open up my eyes to the importance of being a lifelong learner that, you know, in life, you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting and, you know, getting involved in reading books and listening to good stuff and just, you know, feeding your mind, new ideas and expanding your capacity as a result. That to me was kind of an inflection point that has served me to this day. I continue to be just a consummate consumer of inputs that are going to help advance me and make me a better person. In the process of, of, of learning that, I actually stumbled on an article in a magazine about a kid who invented a toy. It was kind of a rags to riches story. I called him up. Uh, we hit it off. And within a few conversations, I was this Canadian distributor. And suddenly I was in the world of toy business. And I uh, had no clue what to do with it because quite frankly, where I grew up in Canada, there was no toy distribution companies or toy manufacturing companies. I grew up where there's agriculture and oil. That's all that was going on in that part of the world. So it was very contrary to what you would think you should be doing. But just slowly but surely, we ended up building that business from basically being carnies who traveled from different events, selling products, hawking products, to kiosks and malls, to eventually distributing in stores, getting some more products. And uh, fast forward to a few years later, we're the largest toy distributor in Canada. And uh, it was a, it was a wild ride, but things that go up fast also tend to come down fast. And I found out the hard way that you can actually grow too fast. And if you get upside down in your, your balance sheet and break covenants, your bank, those are usually very difficult conversations. And uh, as you alluded to, I have started a bunch of ventures. My first three went bankrupt and they were all in the toy business. And um, yeah, some incredible learnings through that. I guess I'm, I'm curious, man, just, it's not been a fun time in the real estate market. Um, just kind of bring this to our own audience, you know, with interest rates kind of going up. How do you, you know, and even the potential of, of loss maybe for some folks, like how do you, like what you've lost it three times, right? Like how do you get yourself back to the point of like, I'm still dangerous, you know, versus like, oh, my whole world is ending. Cause like, you know, it, it, it I, I mean, even as a believer, as a follower of Christ, I know, I'm sure you relate like, as much as we say our identity is not connected to this, in some ways it probably is. There are threads that are, right? And so how, 
talk me through that as someone who's maybe happened that three times. Yeah. Look, I think there's two things that motivate our humanity. I've heard people say three, but for me, I've distilled it down to two, hope and fear. The third one's love, but I'm a big believer that hope comes before love, that, you know, I met my wife, I love her, but I first hoped that she would love her. But anyways, hope and fear are the two main motivators. And fear is the thing that tends to be the first response. It's the fight or flight. It's what's kept us alive, getting changed by saber tooth tigers. And it's just natural. It's just not optimal. And what I can tell you is that hope is actually the greater, more powerful motivator. And the best way to see this is in team sports. So I don't know. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> like twice. <laughs> twice. Okay. Well, I think it is a, you know, it is the American pastime. So no surprise that most of your audience would probably have watched it. There's a great point during that game when you saw the team that went ahead and suddenly they stopped playing to win and started playing not to lose. In other words, fear. We're ahead. We got the lead. We're trying to preserve our leave. The team that's behind but sees it's possible to win, they start playing to win. So you got one team playing not to lose. You got another team playing to win. Hope, while it's not natural, is the more optimal. It's the more powerful force. So taking that analogy into difficult times, the one thing that I would encourage everybody to think about is that this too shall pass. After every winter, there's a spring. And the most important thing is for you to maintain that hope of possibility. To do what you need to do to learn from the difficulties, because here's the other principle. We don't learn from success. Like success is a sucky teacher. We tend to really learn from difficulties. And there's a reason why, you know, our heroes from antiquity in the Old Testament, most of these people went through this crucible of difficult things before they became the hero that they were, that we recognize them as today. I can only tell you that the one thing that I learned is that during that time, while it felt like my world was, was uh, just imploding into me, I came to realize that there was only four things I could control. What I think, what I say, what I feel, ultimately, my first feeling isn't the feeling I need to choose, and then ultimately what I do. Those are the four things. And within that space, if you understand that you can control those things, that's all that you need to know. And that's all you need to do. The rest of it is just outside. It's your circle of concern. You have to focus on your circle of control and what you can influence through that and do the, the necessary steps day by day. So as an example, I would get up in the mornings, I would pray, do my devotions, read from a book, work out, feed myself because I'm a big believer. You can't give what you don't have. And then just focus on what is the most important thing for me to do, again, amongst the chaos of businesses that are dying and or uh, going backwards. You know, after every winter, there is spring. So that's the encouragement I would pass Those off. Those four things, think, say, feel. Do. It's all you can control. You know, just kind of like riffing on that a little bit. It's really encouraging, particularly when you're going through difficulty, because, of course, our world is all we know. There's the world and there's our world and our world is really what we are just consumed in. But it's really just helpful to kind of stop and take perspective and to zoom out and realize, OK, I'm a speck floating on this speck called Earth that is a speck in a galaxy that's a speck in the universe. And that relative to all of that, which I have no control over. How important is my problems, my current uh, scenario in life? And you realize it's not that important actually at all. It's not that significant at all. Yet the flip side of that is because there's only one of you and there will never be another one like you at any point in the future or the past, that makes you infinitely important in this moment. But it also ensures that you have what you need to empower your decisions in the moment because that's all you really have. This is the money you can spend. You know, yesterday's a cancel check. Tomorrow's a promise. you know, today's the only cash you really have. You're talking about cash spending. Today is what you get, right? I mean, this is this is what you have to spend. So you've taken all this and you are about to launch a book. You've launched, you're about to launch, right? Yeah, the book is uh, coming out at the end of this year, so. But you called it Startup Santa. So tell us about the premise of this and, and why you're passionate about this project. Okay. So I think hopefully this will make sense because it, it'll tie it into what my, my current venture is focused on. 
So again, I started off as a toy distributor in the toy business. Um, as I mentioned, I grew the company very quickly, became the largest toy distributor in Canada, found out that you know a little bit of uh, ego creates a lot of overhead, uh, had an incredibly humbling moment of going through a restructuring, which is a fancy word for bankruptcy, spent two years trying to salvage that company, only finally to bankrupt it again, because the first time was to try and fix it. The second time was the final bullet. Had a Hong Kong subsidiary that we had to bankrupt as a result of that. So those are the three bankruptcies. So I got all that in very short order, but ultimately then gave me a better opportunity for a new opportunity being to launch a toy manufacturing company, which I launched in 2008. And um, that on its own was, was pretty harrowing. You're talking about interest rates. So just to give perspective, I actually signed the deal with um, my lender to get a $1 million loan at 24% interest due within a year to launch my company. And I signed that paperwork two weeks before the Great Recession. If I had waited two weeks, it wouldn't have been there because there was no more capital in the market. And quite frankly, uh, I had personal guarantees. So I was very motivated to repay the the, the million dollars of interest within the year's time. And fast forward to a year later, we actually did because we had some things that worked out really well. But I really wanted to memorialize all these incredible lessons because it was just like so much had happened in my life from like toy distributor, toy manufacturer to mergers and acquisitions and a plan to go public. And then it, it just felt like there was some, some really important things I want to make sure I didn't forget. And as I started uh, to, to write this out, and share with people, people said, this is really good. And this would be really helpful to founders and entrepreneurs and, and anybody who's an innovator in the market to help them benefit from the, the experiences that you've uh, you've created. So, so Startup Santa is basically my journey through the toy business, but I've taken a, a unique structure in that every chapter takes an iconic toy that you'd be familiar with, uh, talks about what it is that it teaches us, and those lessons, then I tie with lessons from my experience in the toy business together. So it's meant to be fun because it'll give you some history in the toy, but also some experience of things that I went through and just unpack that. And the end of the book is a transition from the toy business into my new venture, which is Pila and the launch of Lomi. And <clears throat> I talk about John Newton who is a hero of mine and somebody who I have a lot of regard for. And, and for your listeners who don't know John Newton, John Newton was a slave trader um, and he was off the coast of Ireland with a, a ship uh, doing his work. And in the middle of that, a massive storm uh, came on him. He got on his hands or was on his knees and, and prayed to God and said, you know, if you save me from this moment, I will promise to dedicate my life to helping make up for the wrongs I've done. Because he always felt conflicted about what he was doing. And uh, he was saved. He went back to uh, London uh, and teamed up with William Wilberforce. And together, they collectively abolished the slave trade in the British Empire. And while you may not know that story, you may know it. The one thing you know for sure is that he wrote the infamous hymn, Amazing Grace. And every time I listen to that hymn, when he says, who saved a wretch like me, I, I just I feel the, the passion in those words because I think we all can sense that there's things in our life that have brought us shame and that we're not uh, proud of. And for myself, you know, being a toy maker, I literally made billions of pieces of plastic, shipping them around the planet, putting smiles on kids' faces. And honestly, it was, it was a blast. I loved doing it. But I always had a sense of remorse because a big part of my business were impulse toys, things that were low price points. And the dirty little secret in the toy business, it's $100 billion a year. Within 90 days, most of those toys end up in landfill. So I knew I was creating a lot of waste. So when I left the toy business, I really wanted to reimagine how could I apply my agency and my experience to something that's truly going to be a part in creating God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? How can I build value into people and the planet? And, um, and that's my journey into building a company that's focused on sustainability. I definitely want to get this book though. So first, where 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 am I going to to get this? Can I pre-order it? Yeah, actually, you'll for the moment you go to my website, bradpeterson.com, and you can actually sign up. You'll get the first chapter for free. So you can decide whether or not you want to read any more. But uh, it'll be on all the usual suspects uh coming into the holiday at the end of this year. So okay, if you cool. time for Christmas, there should be some opportunities around that. Yeah, I see it here. Uh, Brad Peterson, that's P E D E R S E N dot com. Uh, 
So I, I'm curious. So I was looking at some of the stuff. So like you have this product that you, you know, one of the things you're doing, your sustainability launch is this food processor. I mean, like it's a, in the realm of sustainability, explain the product so I don't butcher it. But the question <laughs> I really have for you yeah. is like, how do you, how did you pick that? Like as the entrepreneur, right? Like how do you know, now that you know, you want to go into sustainability, like how do you go into that? Uh, so explain what the product is because I did a terrible job. But then like, how did you land on that? I guess I want to know your thought process in the world. Now, yeah, you, the whole world is in front of you. Like sustainability, yeah. dude, like, oh my goodness. You know, like, why do you pick this? Okay, so I want to make a pause and, and ensure your your uh, listeners know that um, my life is a series of happy accidents. Suggesting that you can actually connect the dots looking forward is really uh, hubris. You can only connect them looking backwards. So let me just give you the sort of the advent of how I landed on this opportunity. Uh, in 2017, I had just merged my toy company with another toy company. And collectively, we were doing north of 100 million, 130 employees, offices around the world. Um, and our goal was to um, do a bunch of M&A and to roll up and go public. And, uh, and we were in the process of doing that. And unfortunately, uh, on paper, while it looked good, uh, the two entrepreneurs, the two founders who had this new merge entity had a cultural clash. And so we weren't getting along and it was starting to affect the business's ability to function. And I found out the hard way that you go from a majority in your company to a minority in, in a, um, a merge company. And uh, suddenly you can end up on the short end of the straw. So I chose the short straw and I got fired from the own company I founded. I was forced into the marketplace. And quite frankly, as I reflect back on it now, I've learned that often God will save you from what you want to give you what you need. Because while it was a terrible thing in the moment, it freed me up to think about new possibilities for the future. So while you heard the story about my motives around sustainability, I was forced to think about something new. So I had the option to actually go there. And along came this opportunity called Pila. And Pila was founded by a guy named Jeremy who was creating these compost, these creating products out of compostable materials that had the grace fund of life. And uh, I was really inspired by the story. And again, I already told you about my John Newton sort of passion project. That, hey, this is a way I can help make up for the difference. So I got involved uh, and I knew how to scale companies. So together we worked together with a third party named Matt and we grew that business very rapidly. But we had a problem. And the problem is, is where do you put, what do you put a compostable case at the end of its life? Like, where do you put it? Most people don't have access to home composting. The green bins, if they exist, usually don't take compostable plastic or uh, compostable bio uh, composites. So literally we were solving all the problem. We were looking for a way to create a solution on the home that would take the products uh, from where they are back to dirt, back to soil. And uh, so that was the initial idea behind Lomi. And then as we started going on this path, we said, well, wait a minute, it looks after all organic waste. So that's food waste as well as biocomposites. And so the machine started to solve not just our problem, but a bigger problem that food waste going to landfill is buried anaerobically because it's in plastic bags and they put a lot of dirt on top. And when it breaks down aerobically, it produces methane gas. And methane gas is like super bad in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, global warming. So we launched this product on a crowdfunding campaign via Indiegogo in April, 2021. Um, you know, crowdfunding campaigns I've done a few in my time. They're not easy to do. Quite frankly, if you do six figures in a crowdfunding campaign, that's remarkable. If you do seven figures, you're a unicorn. We launched this product, told a really great story about what the promise was, and we ended up selling over 20,000 units and uh, $7 million worth. And it was like, wow, okay, we found something that people are excited about and that they, they can get behind. Yeah, look at Lomi is the world's first smart waste appliance, and it's designed to literally eliminate a messy, smelly, stinky, um, you know, rat uh, attracting problem in people's homes and taking food waste and turning it into a really rich um, Lomi earth that becomes a superfood for your plants. And he's done all kinds of studies now that show that the output actually grows uh, crops. In fact, to your audience, one of the things we've been doing is we've been working with multifamily residentials where we're taking a waste stream that is in this, this residential 
we're, we're, we've got units uh, working with Lomi, creates an output. That output is then used in the green spaces or the community gardens. And they're now taking what was uh, garbage and turning it to gold from trash to treasure. And wow, that's really cool. It's, you know, this is a part of like in God's economy, there is no waste, right? Everything that everything that has an end of life in God's economy becomes the source of new life for something new. And we're just completing the circle that he already created. Ah, uh, dude, I love that. Like, it, I, I, especially when you think about thinking about that in our own like profile of communities. I mean, that you know, it's typically what we go after is large apartment communities, which I'm, sure, you know, there is a ton of waste that comes from two hundred. You know, I've I've rented, I've owned. You know, I, I own rentals, so uh, that's really interesting. So, you know, I, I guess I want to kind of vision visualize that real quick. So you have these stations across like how would you put that into a garden style apartment community or is, is this more of an urban type thing explain explain what that would look like there's different solutions to uh to the scenarios like if if any of your listeners are interested i'm more than happy to make connections with our team of how we can make it happen but the idea being is that uh every resident actually would have a machine and we make it extremely simple for the program to work um, we have like a white glove onboarding process. Uh, again, we're just diverting a waste stream, uh, reducing the strain on the garbage pickup within the residence to begin with. So that's a cost saving right from the get go, uh, producing an output that can either be used to fertilize the residents if they have like plants or green spaces or community gardens. And if that's not an option, then it'll be collected and taken away to composters who will turn around and sell it because it's a value to them. So again, taking what was previously a waste stream that was useless and turning it into something extremely useful and valuable. I mean, I think about the impact of this, like in a city like New York, right? Where like, if you've uh -huh. been and you just look at, you know, they just throw, like you go, you go on trash pickup day, right? And the city is just lined with mountains of trash bags. But I think about, you know, that that's an issue and that's, you know, rats everywhere. But I yeah. even think about just the, the single person or not even single, just the, the, the house, you know, a small unit, and this is a way that you can, you know, re, you know, recycle, reuse, you know, your food waste. I mean, and, and now you can, you know, feed the, the plants in your home. I mean, that, that just sounds like a really, really cool thing if it can catch. I guess my question to you is, how do you solve that, right? Like, how do you get people, how do you get this to catch? And maybe it is, maybe you're, maybe it's, you know, the, the tide is rising, but I'm curious on, on, on what, you know, talk to me through that. I mean, it sounds like an amazing product, but really it's only an amazing product if the, if people are really interested in sustainability, right? Yeah. Look, uh, one of your recent guests was uh, talking about the importance of storytelling. And I think that is um, what we're really good at is, and we agree by the way, I mean, there's a reason that if you ask the average American, they can only recite one or two of the 10 commandments, but you know, they can pretty much verbatim recite the story of Noah David, Moses, because we just learn through stories. That's how we connect. We, uh, we've done a really good job. This is a new category. Smart waste is something that's unique and new, but the first step is awareness and between, uh, you know, legislation that's coming. So I know in the state of California by 2025, all food waste has to be diverted out of landfill. Um, so there's several states that are also now uh, on that bandwagon. So you, you can kind of see that we're moving in that direction because again, it's been deemed a huge strain. Like if you look at the issues in, in North America, landfills are filling to capacity. They have less room. Uh, close to 50% of the volume of the current waste stream is made up of food waste. And of course that produces methane, which is public enemy number one. So there's a bunch of reasons why people are hitting it. And what our job has been really is to educate consumers. Yes, on the virtuous side of it, but more importantly, what's the pain? And the pain is most people actually have these messy, stinky little bins for their food waste, or they have a garbage bin that has fruit flies and rat issues or raccoons tip it over the curb. Uh, Lomi literally takes all that and by pressing a button overnight, just magically turns it into this nutrient dense Lomi earth that you that has use and utility. So we've taken something that was previously just gross and turned it into something that's delightful. I, I, here's, a, here's my last question before we get out of here. Guys, bradpeterson.com. Go, go check this guy out. How do three entrepreneurs come up with such a cool, like that you can turn food into dirt, right? Like where, where do you start for that? You got to go find some really good engineers, scientists. Like <laughs> what was that conversation? Like, hey, we're going to go build this machine that turns your food waste into soil. 
yeah. <laughs> you know well look again problem solving we kind of open up the the conversation about you know what are the problems and the bigger the problem the bigger the opportunity for uh, you to create value and, and be compensated for building a, res a resolution to it. Look, we, we really had this issue. We were making these products from the you know, biodegradable materials. We just didn't have a place to send them. And our customers were buying them. We, we've literally had millions of customers who were buying our products and saying, okay, well, we're, we feel good about this, but now what do we do with it? And we'd say, well, put it in your home composting bin. Oh, I don't have one. Do you have a local industrial composter? Oh, they won't take it. So we had literally been taking the stuff back and we were looking after the end of life at our end. And we actually had initially ideas of doing, you know, a, a massive industrial uh, unit that would just, you know, we would take all our stuff back and we'd look after it and, and give it the end of life. But then we said, well, look, Tesla has democratized the electrification of vehicles. I mean, why don't we just do this on everybody's home? So my background being a toy maker, I mean, toy makers, I've made everything from digital projectors to RC helicopters to collectibles and it's a very diverse sort of skill set so my team in asia had incredible sort of utility and so um, you, you had so many of the resources already lined up given your your past life and background amazing man that's, new. yeah the father working right there man that's so cool Brad, I, you know, I just like, I love these conversations, man. I, you know, it, it, it's such a gift to have a guy like you on the show to uh, even kind of get out of our industry for a little bit of real estate, but know that so many of these principles apply across life, across business, uh, our faith. So uh, grateful for the work you're doing, man. Thanks for showing up powerfully for our community. Brad Peterson, B, Brad Peterson, P-E-D-E-R-S-E-N.com for those who want to grab his book. Anything else, man, you'd leave us with before we get out of here today? couple things you know we talked about some of the adversities and and the book kind of unpacks a lot of that but there's romans 5 3 through 8 we rejoice in our sufferings sufferings produce perseverance perseverance character and character give us hope mm. that word i talked about the power of hope we have to understand that there's a cycle there that part of the challenges are to create character you know adversities you have a choice to turn them to your advantages and I just want people to know that, that it's, it's biblical. It is the design of our creator that we should expect that there's going to be hard things in our life, but this is how we develop into the people that we need to become. And uh, there's a famous quote by Leonardo da Vinci that I love. He says, we fail to realize it is about a process, a journey. The master is the one who stays on the path day after day, year after year. The master is the one who's willing to try and fail and try again for as long as he or she lives. And I just want to encourage people to know that if it's difficult, if you're finding challenges, rejoice because that's going to lead to hope for a better future. So good, dude. When you know that there's a father who loves you and who has seized that and who's building something in you, a, a hope right, for an eternity, to think about that you're, you are an eternal being. There's a father in heaven who's actually trying to form that in you. Dude, that's a sweet reminder. I needed that today. Thank you. Uh, guys, if you enjoy the show as much as I do, please uh, support us by one, sharing this episode, screenshotting this, posting it on wherever you do social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. And and seriously, it goes such a long ways if you'd leave a review uh, to go down to iTunes, go down to the bottom, write a review, uh, make, make it five stars. You know, we don't charge anything for this content, but we ask that you help support it and share it. So grateful for you all, Brad. Thanks again, brother. And uh, looking forward to staying connected, my man. You bet. Thanks, Alice. All right.